Hello Fiber friends! Welcome to the Jillian Eve channel. I'm Evie, and if you call me Jillian, that's okay. That's my middle name. I make yarn, and I make things from yarn, and today I have a really exciting history-bounding cape project. The idea for this project came from Shannon Makes. I'll have a link to her channel down below. Go check her out. She has some fantastic and very inspiring projects, clearly, because here I am being inspired. She did a project last September called Cape Timber, and it was a, a sew along or a make along, and I wanted to participate, but here we are. It's July, so <laughs> I'm ready for Cape Timber in July. <laughs> Sometimes things just take a little longer than we plan. But we're here now. Let me explain a little bit what we're up to. I want to tell you about the history bounding component to this cape, where the hand spun yarn is coming in, and just generally what the plan is. But before we dive in, I've noticed that we've had quite a lot of new subscribers lately, and I just wanted to say thank you all for joining me on this very exciting journey. I can't wait to get to know all of you in this community, so it, go ahead and introduce yourself in the comments down below. And if this is my first video, or if you've seen all of them since the beginning, um, I would love to know, what are you working on right now? What's your big project? Go ahead and share in the comments. I do read all the comments, whether I respond individually or not. I love seeing those comments, so keep them coming. All right, let's do an overview of what we're up to today and then really get to it. Um, I am making this pattern. It's a commercial pattern because I am designing this fabric for the collar. So I thought I'll go easy on myself and just buy some fabric. So the pattern is Simplicity 8263 and I will be making Cape Option B because that's the one that has this faux fur collar. The fabric that I'm using, I got this pink velveteen. It was a clearance closeout fabric. I didn't pay full price for this. I have no idea what I paid for this because I've had it for over a year. <laughs> It's been sitting in my stash for a while, but I think it's calling to me and says, this is the project. I've had this project in mind and I do want to say that I have mentioned this project a few times throughout other videos and there was some silk that I spun that's a very close color to this. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do a little tablet weaving detail with that silk. That might be a different video. We'll see. But if this looks familiar to you, that could be why. <clears throat> Then I needed a lining for the coat and I went to Joann's, that's my local, just kind of general where you can pick up fabric locally store to me. And I was wandering around thinking, what matches this velveteen, <laughs> this bright pink? And I looked and I saw up on the bolts of the uh, like the upholstery stuff, <laughs> the household fabric, not the, not the clothing fabric, but I saw this, look at this. Aren't these the most just wonderfully loud and obnoxious flowers? Like, I just need some loud and obnoxious flower joy right now. And I think these are great. <laughs> I love these flowers. Look out, look at these flowers. <laughs> but they're, um, they do go with my pink and they're a good mood. So I'm going with that for my lining. I think it might be fun if I'm wearing my cape and you know, you get a little sneak peek of giant, obnoxious, joyful flowers. I think that's fun. So <laughs> that's my lining. I have some interfacing too, but that's boring. So we'll move on next to the faux fur collar. I am going to spend most of the details of this video talking about how I am weaving that fabric. I am going to go quickly through the sewing part of it because um, I'm here for the yarn. <laughs> Mostly, mostly. I'll give you some, uh, hopefully we don't have any catastrophes with the sewing, hopefully everything fits, but if there's something weird that comes up, I will talk to you about that. But the yarn and the weaving, I feel like, should be the star of this show. In a recent video, I talked about spinning the yarn for this project using my historical replica spindle. It is a spindle that was discovered near Salt Fleetby. You can go watch that video for more details, um, but I chose to use a breed of sheep that would have possibly been similar to what they had access to in Viking York. So um, the spindle has runes on it that are carved in it, and 
it's just the coolest little moment of history that I feel so excited that I can just touch these things and just imagine what these people in the past, you know, were just going about their daily lives making fabric that they could wear and stay warm and dry and um, I just love that so much. <laughs> so anyway, this is the spindle whirl, but now it's I'm spinning flax with it and it's on a different spindle stick. So I'll put that over there. Go watch that video if you want details on the rune inscribed spindle whirl. This is the yarn I made. So I will be skinning this off and washing it, getting it all ready to weave with. And then the locks that I'm going to use for this Verifolder inspired fabric are these Lester Longwool locks. This is going to be really cool because it's going to look like all these locks are just kind of dangling all around. And I, I can't wait to see what it looks like. I can picture it in my mind. Hopefully it turns out that way. Um, but while I'm weaving, I also want to give you some details about this really cool fabric, this really interesting fabric that will mimic sort of a pelt or a fur, but it's lightweight, it's breathable, it's a woven fabric, and it's from a sheared sheep. So we don't need to uh, hurt the sheep. In fact, it's happy to have its wool off for the summer. So I think this is a really fascinating fabric. I'll give you some historical details while we work on that. Um, and this is the wool that I will be using for that. This is from Heritage Lester's. They did send me these locks a while ago. It's taken me so long to get to this project. Um, and I do feel sad about that. I wish I had used these sooner, but I'm so excited that they are going in an awesome project. So check out that link if you wanna see where uh, these locks came from. These sheep are still happily grazing in their field. Um, and I will definitely be sending a picture to their shepherdess when I get this project done so she can see what became of these locks. It is a little warm outside for capes right now uh, because it's July, <laughs> but I'll be ready for September when it comes and I'm excited for this project. So that's the general overview. Let's get into the thick of it and start sewing. This is a little different for me because I usually do more spinning on this channel and less sewing, but I'm always up for a good fresh project and I am really excited to incorporate more of my hand spun and woven um, items with some sewing projects. So here we are. The first thing I needed to do, of course, was to cut out my pattern pieces. This this pattern had four different cape options, so there were a lot of pieces I didn't actually need. I also uh, did some adjustments. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I like to measure and then make the adjustments on the pattern itself and then cut it out to, um, to that with their measurement or whatever to make it work for me. These are stones I collected by the lake and they work really well for my pattern weights and they're pretty and I like that. And here we have the obligatory aesthetic view of scissors cutting fabric. Let's get another angle. There we go. I feel like I have an official sewing video now because, well, my scissors are out of focus. Clearly, um, I need some practice, I guess. <laughs> Truthfully, cutting this velveteen fabric is kind of a nightmare. It is like the fabric equivalent of glitter because the pile gets cut with each snip of the scissors and there's little tiny pink um, fuzzies everywhere. They get everywhere. I even went to bed that night and there was pink fuzzies on my pajamas and I was like, how did you get here? They are everywhere. Velveteen is definitely not my favorite fabric to use. I do like to weave my own fabrics, but the problem is that it just takes so long to do. And sometimes there are fabrics that I want to explore a little bit. I couldn't really realistically hand weave my own velveteen or even velvet fabric. There's a lot to that and it's not really something accessible to the home weaver. So 
Um, it's all just explorations and seeing what you can work with. I found this tailors and dressmakers chalk in my grandmother's crafting supplies that I inherited. I miss my grandmother. She taught me a lot of good crafting and sewing things. Um, so I do always think of her when I'm doing a project. I use chalk to mark where my, um, my things need to be from the pattern lined up where the side pockets are going to be. That's what I'm doing here with my little dots on either side so that I can make sure I am sewing and uh, piecing it all together correctly. This curve for the shoulder was a little bit tricky because this fabric was so stiff, but it um, I think it all came out pretty well in the end. It worked out just fine. I did find a perfect match to the pink though with this bright pink thread and I'm going to use this bright pink thread for the whole project. Even the lining that uh, it definitely shows up on. <laughs> I like the pink. It's just a joyful color for me right now. Pressing the seams with this velveteen was a little tricky, but if you go the same direction with the iron, it lays the pile down flat and that worked well. I did not pattern match. It's the lining. I didn't feel the need. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Handcrafting any project just takes a lot of time and I really do want to get to the weaving portion of this and so sacrificing the pattern matching time for having the time to do the weaving is a good compromise for what I want to do with this project. For the seams on the inside, because this isn't going to go in the washing machine a lot, I just pinked off most of the seams and that worked well for this project. I have the lining put together and I'm going to put the lining on real quick, but you can't see the full cape until the end. I'm saving it for the reveal. But I wanted to mention that this pattern only went up to size 1X and my body is a 2X. So I did make some adjustments on the pattern when I cut out the pieces. So I'm about to try on the lining <laughs> to see how it does around my shoulders and everything. Um, the, the collar still needs to be sewn, so um, the collar won't be as high as it looks at this moment. But look, it does fit. I'm excited. Oh, that is a good fit. And yep, there's it's a little back. Okay. So there's my shoulder right there. There's where the seam comes together. And this is my arm right here. So I think that my adjustments were just spot on because that for the for this cloak to be tailored in this shape, I feel like it's right right at the tip of my shoulder. That's perfect. It doesn't it doesn't stretch too much. Like if I <laughs> if I hold on to it and kind of chicken wing forward, I can make it tight across my back, but that's that's pushing it to, you know, um to be like that. Just as it naturally hangs, it's not too tight. It's perfect. Yay! And then yep, the let me tip the camera down a little. And the little armholes. <laughs> I'm gonna have to make some um, some gloves. I'm gonna have to knit or maybe I'll buy some, uh, some gloves to go with this. That would be the coolest. Yay, it fits. The changes I made worked. I'm very excited. I love it when a project comes together. Oh, and I only stitched the right side to the wrong side once, so I only had to seam rip once to put the pieces back the right way. So it's all good. All right, I'm gonna finish the construction and I'll see you at the loom. Almost. We still have to finish up this yarn from the spin that we will be using for weaving. Everybody asks me, how do you finish your yarn, especially for weaving? So I thought it would be good to include that here. The first thing, of course, is that I have to take it off of the spindles and I have been using this medieval plying block. Um, it works so 
well and I love it. It's great for getting things off of my spindle sticks. Look at how fast I'm able to wind this. It's amazing. This was a singles yarn and I have done weaving with singles as warp but while I was winding this I was feeling that it was a little bit looser than I was comfortable using for warp in this project. So this will be 100% the weft and I'll use a different yarn for the warp. If you have trouble remembering which direction the warp and weft go, just remember the warp goes up and down because weavers weave from right to weft. <laughs> oh, that was so bad. Anyway, so I'm tying off this skein in four places so that it won't get tangled up because even though this is yarn for weft, I am going to finish it very hard. I mess with it in the soapy water. This is hot water. I went back and forth from hot to cold to shock it a few times and that just helps to felt it just the slightest bit um, so that it will hold up and be very durable. So then I hung it outside in the beautiful sunshine. It was a beautiful breezy day and it was dry within just a few hours. And now the part we've all been waiting for the weaving. This is my 15 inch Shacked Cricut. I am a Shacked dealer, so if you are interested in purchasing this loom or any of the Shacked spinning wheels, I can assist you with that. I do have a web store that is linked in the description below. So the weaving for this project, I was originally planning to use the Cheviot wool that I had spun with my uh, replicated spindle whorl but I decided it was too... It, Cheviot is a wool that doesn't felt very easily, and so even though I finished it very, very hard, it still felt like it didn't quite have enough twist in it to hold together. It just felt a little too weak to be my warp, and because I'm going to be incorporating locks into the weave, I just needed something that was a little stronger. So I chose to go with this yarn instead. This is also hand spun. It's a two ply that I spun from merino and silk. It's a blend. I think there's also some bamboo in there uh, that would be viscous bamboo as rayon. And it's sturdy and it's not too stretchy so I think it will work just fine for my warp. I also want to acknowledge that historically this type of fabric would have been woven with a warp weighted loom and so the difference between a warp weighted loom and a rigid huddle loom in terms of how the tension is dispersed and allowed to change throughout the weaving um, I mean, that gets pretty technical, but suffice to say, if you're not a weaver, I'll keep it simple. There is a difference. It's not the same loom, but I am doing this with the equipment that I have, and uh, that's a rigid head of loom, so here we are. But I do think that's an important thing to note. We don't have to be 100% entirely accurate in all the things, in all the ways to call something historical, especially if it's inspired and history bounding and all of that gives us a lot of freedom to explore these techniques and not be so concerned about using a loom that that was cut from the same lumber that would have been accessible to the area of the thing that were, you know, I'm like, you can go down that rabbit hole so far that it prevents anyone from doing any exploration into those textiles. And that just kills the joy. We don't want to kill the joy. We want to do what we can do with our stuff we have at home, have fun and explore, and history bound along the way. So let's talk about the sheep we met along the way. This is Lester Longwool. Lester sheep have these beautiful, curly, just gorgeous locks that come from their fleece. So. To weave this, I am going to incorporate individual locks into the weave as I go, and it's going to give an overall look of being sort of fur-like. This is a technique that's inspired by Verifelder, and there's also some evidence of other areas, um, like 
Ireland using these kind of shaggy, furry looking pile woven cloaks. Uh, and they are really good at keeping you warm. They will shed water so that they will also keep you dry. And your skin, your body can breathe because it's not like covering yourself in a pelt where you have a whole layer of leather between you and air. <laughs> so it won't overheat you. It breathes and can be very comfortable. So I'm very interested to explore this technique of incorporating locks into the fabric. Uh, the King of Norway uh, at some point was really into these cloaks and, and bought some and then it became fashion and everybody... I guess in Norway wanted a Verifolder cloak from Iceland and it was the thing to have. Um, so they had some regulation on what size these cloaks had to be, how dense the locks were, greatly affected the value, value of the cloak itself. So obviously putting these in by hand takes a lot of time, just as you see here, just prepping these. Um, and to go into the weaving, it takes a long time because I'm trying to pull them individually and also carefully so as not to disturb the locks next to them. I want to keep that little curl on the end. It's so cute. Um, but I also don't want it to be too thick, so I have to kind of keep them consistent, but also work with the way that the sheep naturally grew these wool locks in a authentic, traditional verifolder uh, the sheep that would have been used would have been a dual coated fleece and a dual coated sheep and so that would definitely be different than this um, type of wool. This luster is a uh, long wool and a dual coated uh, sheep would have long locks as well as an inner shorter coat. That's called the tog and the thel. Those are Icelandic words for the um, parts of a dual coated sheep. I do have an Icelandic fleece, and so I may be revisiting this again in the future um, for some more of those kinds of inspired textiles. But my plan for that fleece is to uh, spin and then weave cloth from it to create an apron dress for a full-on Norse medieval um, woman's dress outfit. When I start weaving, I like to leave a long tail of weft so that I can grab a darning needle and do a quick little hem stitch. I do that by going under a number of warps, two in this case, and then I come back around and sew into the first two rows of um, weaving and then I go under the next two and then I come back around and up into the fabric that I have woven and that creates a nice edge that holds together so that even when I cut this off the loom it's not going to unravel um, we don't want anything to unravel. That would not be a good time. So this way when I'm finished, I can cut it right off the loom and the edge is already hemmed. I will do this on the other end of the fabric as well once I finish weaving to the other side. So here we are. We are weaving and we are adding these locks into the fabric. You can see a few rows that I've done of just the plain weave and that helps to pack the locks in and secure them and then on the next row I am going to manually <laughs> and tediously add locks going all the way across. Um, in the historical uh, Verifolders that uh, we have information on, there's not a whole lot of information on it, but um, we do still have a couple extant garments uh, in this type of a weave and it looks like there wasn't a specific number of warps that warp threads that uh, they went under sometimes it was two sometimes it was four i think for me it seems that alternating and varying the number of warp threads that each lock goes under is helping me to stagger them 
which gives a nice full look to the outside of the cloth, but it also keeps from one section um, to build up and build up and build up so that it becomes very uneven when I'm trying to pack down my, uh, my warp, when I'm trying to do the weaving. <laughs> And so the staggering actually makes sense from a technical weaving point of view. So that was a very interesting thing to learn. One of the things I quickly realized as I was weaving this was that when I am placing these locks into the fabric, it uh, creates an uneven edge that I'm trying to beat against with my reeds. So I am using my weighted uh, beater. It's also from Schacht. I love it because I can um, beat down the edge of the fabric and make sure that the locks are securely integrated into this fabric and I um, get a much tighter packed weave even though I'm using a rigid huddle loom. It's tighter than what I can achieve uh, from the the reed that I'm using and it helps me to keep all of the edges and cloth even as well. So this actually mimics a little bit more closely what would have been the original tool used for weaving this type of fabric and um, the ability to pack it in very tightly. So that's kind of a cool compromise between what I have and what I'm using now and the historical uh, way that this would have been packed in to keep everything very tightly woven. And if you notice on the edge of the cloth where I'm weaving, there are no locks. And the reason for that is because I want to create an edge that I can fold over to uh, sturdily attach some buttons or something that will help me to attach this to the cloak so that it will be a removable collar. Having a collar like this, it's very beautiful. It's very dramatic. I also want to be able to take it off if I am just not feeling the drama. So <laughs> that is my plan for that um, and why there are no locks on that edge there. But it also is kind of a little view as to what the fabric actually looks like behind the locks so that you can see that it is a tabby weave and it's um, it's just easier to see what the background fabric is looking like in this weave. But this is taking quite a long time and it's actually taking longer than I expected and I did expect it to take a long time. So I think we will end up having a part three on this project. Um, I have had the cloak hanging on my dress form. I want the lining to stretch out because there are some sections of it that were cut on the bias and just the type of of cloth that it is, it's going to stretch. I am also still considering that silk that I spun that matches this velveteen so well that I might need to do a little tablet woven trim to go around the bottom of this cape. I think that would just be a really, really fun detail. I'm still considering it. Let me know in the comments if you think that I should include some tablet weaving on this history bounding cape or is it enough drama as it is with these locks that will be going around the collar. Uh, but I'm excited to show you how this construction works out and how it all goes together at the end. Thank you so much for joining me in this history bounding project. I hope that this is something that is fun and unique and interesting for you to watch. Remember to subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Happy spinning friends!